All right, I hope the wait for this set of notes is uh, worth the wait. And let's talk about primary productivity. So primary productivity has to do with energy. And it's basically energy being captured from the sun and then being taken from you know, sunlight to energy that's used by living things. So as you know from freshman biology, the way that organisms capture solar energy is through photosynthesis. Here I have the equation for photosynthesis. It starts out with carbon dioxide and water, and then the source of most of the energy in uh, all the ecosystems on the planet tends to be the sun. And with the input of that solar energy, it gets stored in the form of uh, glucose, C6H12O6, and then oxygen is released as a waste product. So the glucose that's produced is a form of biomass. Biomass is all the biological molecules in an organism. Uh, it's basically what you would get if you took an organism and sucked out all the water. The stuff that's left would be the biomass and it represents the stored amount of energy. And energy enters ecosystems always through producers and most commonly it enters through photosynthesis, though there are some ecosystems that are light independent and uh, rely on other mechanisms, mostly chemosynthesis, uh, in order to produce energy. But for the most part, it's solar energy that is um, powering an entire ecosystem. So what is primary productivity? So its fancy definition is the rate at which solar energy is converted into organic compounds via photosynthesis over a unit of time. So it's measured in units of energy per unit area per unit time. So I'm trying to kind of um, represent that here with this image of here's sunlight and this is representing energy that's going to be converted into chemical energy in biomolecules. And so it's how much energy is being captured per unit area, because think about it, if you were looking at this small area of this field or whatever, um, you would be capturing less energy just because there would be less plants there. Um, and then it's also per unit time. Uh, this is more an average than a, you know, okay, we're going to measure how much energy is being captured at 10.45 p.m. or 10.45 a.m. It's more like, okay, this is how much energy is captured per year is a more common measurement. And apologies for the random noises. One of the cats has decided to play in something like they do whenever I'm trying to record a video. All right. So uh, you can look at different biomes and you can actually see differences in the net primary productivity. So if we look at this graph on the left, it's measured in grams per meter squared per year. Um, and so the grams is probably a measure of mass, which is a measure of biomass. So it's indirectly like how much glucose is being produced, which is a rate of, uh, way to measure the rate of photosynthesis. So the most productive ecosystems per unit area per year are algal beds and coral reefs. That's an aquatic ecosystem, obviously. And the most productive um, a terrestrial ecosystem is a tropical rainforest, um, which is probably pretty easy to, to realize. There's a lot of plant and animal life in tropical rainforests. They tend to get the most direct sunlight, the largest amounts of sunlight, um, constant sunlight throughout the year. And so they're going to be pretty productive. You'll notice that some aquatic ecosystems that you might expect to be more productive are less so. For example, the least productive aquatic ecosystem is the open ocean. And that's because if you remember, we have those limiting factors uh, where you won't have a lot of nutrients or you might not have a lot of dissolved oxygen or dissolved carbon dioxide. And those keep the rate of photosynthesis lower. Whereas someplace uh, that's technically an aquatic ecosystem, like a wetland where it's kind of shallow uh, water, there's plenty of nutrients from soil and things decomposing. Um, and since things are shallow, there's usually plenty of carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. And also since things are shallow, plenty of light penetrates through the water in order to power photosynthesis. So that is also a highly productive ecosystem. In general, the forests tend to be more productive than other areas. So notice tropical seasonal forest, which is like, um, which is like a 
certain areas like India has tropical seasonal forest. It's got like a wet season and a dry season. Temperate evergreen forest is pretty productive. Temperate deciduous forest is also pretty productive. Here we start seeing the grasslands show up. So savanna is more productive than boreal forest, mostly because these guys get less sunlight. Remember, these are closer to the poles, meaning that in the winter, they're gonna have very little sunlight coming in. Um, then you've got woodland and shrubland, um, starting to get more towards grasslands. Temperate grasslands are showing up. Upwelling zones, if you remember from aquatic biomes, um, I think it was part two, we talked about how in upwellings, that happens where um, nutrient rich water rises and it goes towards the top so then you'll have nutrients together with dissolved carbon dioxide as well as light which will provide resources for plenty of photosynthesis um, then you've got uh, other ocean zones lakes and streams tundra is very unproductive desert is also very unproductive mostly because there's less water there and if you remember from our carbon, uh, from our photosynthesis equation, you need water for photosynthesis. If you don't have it, you're not going to have as high levels of photosynthesis. Um, and then desert and semi-desert are also going to be less productive because they have less water. Rock, sand, and ice, usually less free water. And also, you know, it's not good soil for things to grow in. So photosynthesizers won't really be there in large amounts. Um, and then what the next two graphs are showing you on the next graph, it's showing you what percentage of the Earth's surface is made up of each of these um, various biomes. So notice while algal beds and reefs are super productive, they make up a tiny portion of the Earth's surface area. So their contribution to the total primary production on Earth is relatively small. Whereas tropical rainforests have very high productivity, they make up about 4% of the Earth's surface, and so they make up a large chunk of the percent of primary production. Another thing to notice, if you look at open ocean, it has very low productivity, but it makes up about 65% of the Earth's surface, so that tiny amount of productivity per square meter ends up adding up to a lot of large percent of the Earth's productivity. So it, it's not very productive per unit area, but since there's so much of it, it does contribute a lot to the productivity. And productivity is important because, as we'll talk about when we talk about food webs and chains, producers are the basis of all the food webs, food chains in an ecosystem. Without them, you can't have other organisms in the area. So the amount of energy they bring in is going to determine how many consumers can live in an area, how many decomposers can live in an area. So we've got a few things that um, we got to talk about with primary productivity. We have two different measures, gross productivity and net productivity. Gross productivity is just straight up how much photosynthesis is happening. Um, and so it's not considering what's being used up by producers. We tend to think of producers as only doing photosynthesis, so they make the energy for us, but they're living creatures too. They're going to use up some of the energy. They're not sitting there going, oh, I'm going to make some glucose today, so that way uh, when this cow comes along and eats some of it, they can have some energy. No, they're producing glucose for themselves. Um, and so they're going to end up using some of it through cellular respiration. But we're not thinking about that for gross primary productivity. Instead, we're just looking at what's being produced by photosynthesis in total. So that is all of the energy that's being fixed by producers in a given area. Net primary productivity is what happens when you take away the stuff being used for um, work to keep a plant alive. So here we have solar energy being transferred into chemical energy stored during photosynthesis. That's our gross primary productivity. And then notice out of all that energy, some of it gets used for work um, and it's 
represented by an R here that stands for respiration, for cellular respiration. And then the rest of the energy that's not used up by the plant gets stored as biomass, grow new leaves, grow new stems, make the plant larger, grow seeds. And that stored biomass is available to any consumer that then comes along and eats that plant. So that remaining energy that's left there, um, that's stored in the plant, is called the net primary productivity. So it's your total photosynthesis, or total amount of energy uh, stored by photosynthesis, minus the amount that's actually used by the plant. And it represents what's available to the rest of the ecosystem. Because if the plant uses it up, you're not going to be able to use it. Apologies, the cat just tried to palm a foot from under the couch and startled me. All right, if producers in an ecosystem have a gross primary productivity of 12,000 kilocalories per meter squared per year, so their gross primary productivity is 12,000 kilocalories, which is a unit of energy per meter squared per year, and the amount they use for life processes or respiration is 3,500 kilocalories per meters squared per year, what is the net primary productivity? And our formula on the previous sheet was net primary productivity equals gross primary productivity minus the amount used for respiration. And I'm sorry to say, unlike some of the other sciences, you do not get a formula chart for AP Environmental. So you're going to have to remember potentially how to do this calculation because I was looking at some of the test questions that have been on previous tests that cover this topic, and some of them have you calculate either the gross primary productivity or the net primary productivity. Productivity. So you're going to have to remember this. So I can just plug everything into this formula and my net primary productivity is going to be equal to 12,000 and I always write my units because sometimes if you don't have your units on an answer on the test, you can get, you, you can lose the opportunity to earn a point. So it's 12,000 minus 3,500 kilocalories per meter squared per year. I know I ran out of space. So what's 12,000 minus 3,500? That is going to be 8,500 kilocalories per meter squared per year. So that's how much is stored in that ecosystem and is available for consumers to eat. If you have something that say, let's say there's a particularly cloudy year, and I'm going to do this in a different color so it's apparent. Let's say there's a particularly cloudy year. Um, a lot less sunlight's getting down. And so we see that instead of 10,000 kilocalories per year, now, I mean, instead of 12,000, we're going to have 10,000 kilocalories per meter squared per year. Well, if that happened, then since our grant, uh, gross primary productivity dropped by 2,000, that means that our net primary productivity calculation would change and we would have, we're still using the same amount for respiration, but now instead of having 8,500 kilocalories to support the rest of the ecosystem, we only have 6,500 kilocalories, which means less consumers can live off of this. So that lets us see that if we change up uh, the level of primary productivity, that's gonna affect the entire rest of the ecosystem. So it's something to keep in mind. Uh, those are the kind of conclusions that you could be asked to draw on, say, a free response question. So here is a map, um, and I've got a video, so let me play it, and I hope it will show. It's going to show you how productivity changes over the course of a year for several years. Anything that's super dark green is going to be an area of high productivity. So notice in February, we have this area around the Amazon that's a little more productive. This area of rainforest here in the Congo is very productive. And then you also have some rainforest here in Indonesia that's very productive. You've got some other areas of productivity, especially where you have some forest land and stuff like that but let's watch as this changes so now we're going into um, the next year 
and notice how it fluctuates. So when there's more ice and snow, productivity decreases. When it's winter for that hemisphere, productivity decreases because there's less sunlight. But whenever it's the spring, the productivity is going to increase as in the summer as well. There's some areas that never have productivity, like the Sahara Desert, the Gobi Desert in the center of Asia, the Middle East, and Greenland, because those are covered by either desert or by ice so they're not going to be very productive also notice some areas of low productivity for example I'm gonna to change to the laser pointer for example in Australia in the center there is some productivity but it never gets very high and that's because the center of Australia is mostly desert um, up here in northern Canada you'll have some productivity so let me see about replaying it There we go. Let's see if we can replay it. All right. So notice that you do have productivity in the summer in the northern hemisphere in these really far northern latitudes. That's because when the spring comes, there's a much uh, there's a temporary thawing and there is a huge increase in the amount of productivity. But that's going to disappear in the winter because things are going to get snowed on. It's going to be too cold. And so you're going to have that decrease in productivity as well. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right, now productivity in aquatic ecosystems is limited by a few different factors. It's limited by how much light penetrates through water. So keep in mind that we have this diagram here that's showing us how deep the different colors of light penetrate. So the kind of purple high energy light and the red low energy light gets either absorbed or reflected fairly quickly. And so if you had an organism that was red, um, well, that was absorbing red light, it wouldn't be able to survive very deep. Um, if you want a uh, light that penetrates deeper into the ocean, that would be blue light. So you would want an organism that absorbs blue light. Um, that means it wouldn't look blue because the color of light we see is what's reflected away. So any photosynthesizers that are living in water um, have to adapt to decreased amounts of visible light, especially the deeper you go. But that's also why the photic zone is a very big limiting factor for uh, where things can grow in the ocean. Um, so plants will have or producers will have these uh, types of adaptations that will help them to gather more light as much as possible. So they'll grow these thin ribbony leaves that will increase the surface area. Think of like beds of kelp or seagrass. And also they'll have most of their chloroplasts located on the tops of their leaves that face the surface of the water. So that way they're able to maximize the amount of energy they pick up through photosynthesis without losing some because, you know, it's having to travel through an entire leaf. And then this is just showing you productivity in the ocean. So remember, we talked about the fact that some aquatic zones are going to have very high productivity. Notice that most of the high productivity, which is the kind of deeper um, reddish brown colors, are along coastlines. And that's because you get sediment washing off from the land, and that's going to give you high nutrients. Um, but notice there are things like this area. That's actually an upwelling. Uh, there's a seasonal upwelling off the coast of South America that will bring up nutrients and that will allow photosynthesis to happen. Um, you can also have some of these uh, nutrients being spread from the coastline by water currents and wind currents. Um, anything that's a shallow area like a continental shelf is also probably going to have higher productivity. But notice there are these areas of lower productivity out here in the open ocean. There is like less to no nutrients. So you're not going to have a lot of producers out here. Same thing in this belt of water around Antarctica. You're going to have less nutrients because you don't have a lot of, you know, soil and sediment washing into the water from Antarctica since it's covered in ice. And so you don't have a lot of nutrients there unless there's some sort of upwelling happening, bringing it up from the bottom of the ocean. And so that's going to limit the amount of photosynthesis you have happen. 
So after producers convert solar energy into chemical energy, then once they store it in their body as biomass, consumers come along and we get that energy by eating it. And we're going to talk in a lot more detail about that when we talk about food chains and food webs and also energy transfer and ecosystems. So with no further ado, Tree Me says, have a good day.